Finding out what being royal is all about is the least of Sophia's problems. I was not prepared for the sheer amount of musical and magical tomfoolery that would occur in this series. This is a theater kid's dream. If the show's My Little Pony friendship is magic and Steven Universe had a baby that grew up to be a Disney adult, it would be this show, and I know that sounds like a roast, but I really enjoyed it. Do a video to the show. Are you? Are you? Butt lovers. Welcome back to the lore series where we explore shows and commercials that one time that no one else is brave enough to. Usual disclaimer, my deep dives are not made for kids even though the shows I'm watching are, okay? I'm, I'm weird. weird. I'm a weirdo. weirdo. I, don't I don't fit in. in. And I don't, I don't want to fit in. in. Sophia the First's pilot movie came out in 2012 and the new episodes aired from 2013 to 2018. 109 episodes overall and I watched every single one. Back when the show came out, I was a freshman in high school and I remember my little sister really wanted to watch with me, but I was super against this show for whatever reason. I remember what it is. My sister introduced Sophia to me as the brand new Disney princess and I had a visceral reaction. I refused to call her a princess. Me and my sister had fights over this, which first of all, past Athena, she literally is a Disney princess. And second of all, do your algebra homework. You're 14, why are you fighting with a six year old? Loser. So enough about my first impressions when the show first came out. Let's check out some common sense media reviews just to keep them in mind and see if we agree with them later. The first one that pops up is from Happy Mama 2 and she doesn't sound very happy. Not appropriate for young kids. I love the idea of a princess show for kids that actually brings in other princesses. It is very hard to find princess shows or movies for kiddos under six. I personally feel Sophia, spelt wrong, uncultured does encourage bad behavior. Not only is Amber usually always mean, I do feel, yes, eventually they go over what happened and usually apologize, but I still feel it relays the wrong message. Not only that, but why do Disney shows for kids always have to have a villain? Seriously, when kids are young and at an age under seven before they can consciously understand that big picture and how to reason, etc., they are very monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> okay, so another review. Negative messaging followed by positive is not good for children. My three-year-old daughter wanted to watch the show and I have watched the first few episodes with her. So far in the first three episodes or so, this is what the episode teaches us. You will be judged for being different. Changing yourself to fit in is good. Boys and girls cannot participate in the same activities. We should be afraid of others who look different and have different customs. Of course, followed by the end of the episode, we learn the opposite of those lessons, but child psychology research shows that negative lessons are the ones that stick. Nice argument. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. <laughs> they don't want kids shows to have a story. It's very fascinating. So how does this show actually hold up? Let's look at the premiere first. This show started with a movie, like Jimmy Neutron, another show I've covered. Also, this was the only part of Sophia the First that was not on Disney+. Plus. I had to buy this on Amazon Prime. Boo! Boo stinky! So picture this. She was a girl in the village doing all right. Then she became a princess overnight. How did this happen? Well, her mom married the king, of course. It's a good thing her mom is hot or else she'd still be... <gasps> Middle class. That was a joke, obviously. Some of you guys play this shit in the background and I'll, and I'll have things on the screen that say that was a joke and then you don't even know that it was a joke. So I'm just letting you know that was a joke, okay? The scene of all the people welcoming Sophia as the newest princess was so funny because a lot of them had these open mouth smiles, but there was this operatic music playing in the background. So it just looked like they were singing at her. My, my face when there's a new princess. <laughs> That's what they were doing. So far we met Sophia, the titular bitchular, her mother Miranda, the king, her new stepdad, and sideburn haver Roland, her friends from the village Ruby and Jade, and now we're meeting her new step siblings, Amber and James. Right off the bat, these two give me Sharpay and Ryan energy. Blonde, rich twins, where Amber is a diva and James is a well-intentioned follower. And on top of that, they can both sing their little hearts out. I'm getting ahead of myself, but for the purpose of this comparison, season one, episode 18, Amber has a song called Biggest is Best, which need I remind you, High School Musical 3, Sharpay in the song I Want It All sang, don't you see that bigger is better and better is bigger? It's genuinely almost the same song. Back to the pilot, we see Sophia's first day at Royal Prep, a school where only kids of royalty are allowed to go. Huh. 
We'll get back to that. But anyway, Sleeping Beauty's fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether run the academy and therefore uphold the monarchy. Because of course they would. They benefit from it. Amber is dead set on making Sophia's first day at royal prep the worst. There's this swing at the recess playground that James says he makes all the new kids go on. So this magical swing takes Sophia and throws her into a fountain. Can we talk about that? We teach perfect poised little angels and give them access to a hazing machine. What do you think they're gonna do when you give them access to a swing that launches people into a fountain? You think they're not gonna use it? It's like the Adam and Eve apple tree, but way funnier. Like, I'm sorry, Sophia, you got got, but can you even blame the kid? First day of school sucked ass, but King Roland gave his new daughter this amulet. This is the amulet of Avalor, and unless you've watched the show before, you don't even know how big of a deal this is. All we know so far is that this necklace gives Sophia the ability to talk to animals, including her new bestie bunny named Clover, voiced by Wayne Brady. Amazing! When the royal sorcerer Cedric finds out that Sophia has the amulet of Avalor, he looks through his book of magic, which states, With each deed performed, for better or worse, a power is granted a blessing or curse. And with this information in mind, he becomes determined to steal it. This movie does not do Cedric justice, by the way. Well, most things don't. But what I will say is with this being my first impression, I really thought he was going to be a generic villain. Boy, was I wrong. He is great. Here in the movie, though, he just gets Sophia to unknowingly freeze everyone in the ballroom with a spell. It actually makes them fall asleep. Sleep. I don't know why in my notes I said freezes them. Weird. Not anticipating that he too would be frozen. Why didn't he just say the spell? Because then the plot wouldn't happen, okay? Shut up. This is when another amulet power is revealed. When Sophia needs guidance, a Disney princess will be summoned to her. This time Cinderella was there to offer her advice, and for whatever reason, seeing her in this style of animation really freaks me out. Like, that's not Cinderella, that's Cindy. It's like those Wreck-It Ralph versions. It just hurts my brain. It just feels like they'll continue to repackage it over and over again so the story never dies. But anyway, Cinderella sings her advice, prompting Sophia to talk things out with Amber. Amber is the only one not frozen sleep. because she wasn't in the ballroom. She was actually in her bedroom crying because everyone liked Sophia better than her. Oh. Boohoo, I wonder why that is. Sophia, I guess, is Gabriella from my elaborate high school musical comparison. Would that make Cinderella Miss Darbus? Or wait, where did Cinderella go? For whatever reason, Cinderella disappearing at the end of the song is so ominous. But Cinderella died 50 years ago. <gasps> but here's the thing, I genuinely think that, trust me, trust me, we'll get into it later. Also from this point on, believe it or not, Amber and Sophia are the bestest of friends. Amber's still not the nicest in general, but she's very loyal to Sophia. It's very sweet and wholesome. Aww. Now let's talk about the wealth gap. Right off the bat, during the movie, when the animals start talking to Sophia, they explain to her how they serve royalty expecting food, like actual food, but they never get it. The implications of this are severe. Why don't the royals think to feed the animals that are making their beds? Why do the animals feel like they have to do work to deserve food? Oh, but it gets worse. Season 1, Episode 2, Amber is shocked to find out that Sophia has invited her village friends to the sleepover. You invited village girls? Side note, hate what Amber is saying, but love the way she sings it. Literally baby Heathers. Their harmonies are killer. And even though they're assholes, if they keep singing like that, I won't care. What were those common sense media reviews saying again? Uh-oh. The first few episodes especially make the royal kids and adults look so bad. Episode one, we cover sexism when the entire school thinks Sophia should not join the derby team because it's for boys. Episode two, as I mentioned already, we go into classism, where Sophia's friends have to prove Amber wrong. What other ism should we cover? Oh yeah, episode three, speciesism. Don't be speciesist. The trolls have to hide away because the humans hate them for no reason. I'm finding out what being royal's all about. Colonialism. No, seriously, everything Sophia needed to be a good princess, she already had. She's personable and genuinely caring. The only time she has faltered has been when these other kids who have supposedly been studying here their whole lives made her question her choices. What is the point of this school? In the episode The Princess Test, all the kids were convinced that the most important part of being a princess was etiquette. Fanning, posture, bowing, bullshit. But Sophia goes off to help an old lady that everyone else initially said no to. Actually, Hildegard didn't even say no, she just flat out ignored her. Anyway, turns out that was part of the test. Plot twist. 
So everyone gets silver stars, except for Sophia that gets a trophy. But personally, I think the episode should have ended like this. All of you get silver stars? Uh, Sophia, since you did everything right, you're the new principal. And uh, there's one thing we forgot. Oh, Hildegard. Oh my gosh, am I the new vice principal? No, you're expelled. Between season one, episode nine, Bailiwick's Day Off, and season one, episode 10, The Tri-Kingdom Picnic, we really see how overworked the castle staff are. In fact, I just censored myself by calling them castle staff. There have been multiple occasions where they just say servants, which, um, that's, uh, okay. They're not sugarcoating it. But anyway, with Bailiwick, it can kind of be dismissed as him being a workaholic. But in the song Picnic of the Year, there was a throwaway joke of two poor maids singing, there we're gonna party until we drop unethical working conditions. <laughs> so funny. Oh, Disney. Season one, episode 21, we have a classic Prince and the Pauper trading places for a day type episode because for once we see how exhausting it is for the king to delegate. Boo fucking who. So he didn't mean to, but he wished upon a mirror and now him and the royal family are bakers. And not only are they terrible at this job, but he sees how much the village people need him. Not because of the wealth gap that needs to be fixed. No, they think he's the best king ever. That's a direct quote. One of the biggest contributions that everyone keeps bringing up is that he built a new dragon slide for the park. Well, he didn't, but he told his people to. The only positive thing that I got out of this episode is that there actually is a ball for villagers. Sure, it's once a year and the royals celebrate every time Amber farts, but still good for them. Season two, episode 14, there's a jewel called the Emerald Key of Hakalo. Hakalo is a hidden island, and if you're wondering why this kingdom doesn't interact with all the other kingdoms, this episode alone proves their right to not trust anybody. Lani, the princess of Hakalo, goes up to Sophia and her family, begging for help and for them them to return her key, but when an identical Princess of Akalo arrives at the castle, they put them both through colonial ass tests. One of the tests to prove which one was the real princess is who can royal dance better. The real Lani does a dance called the Swaying Blossom, while the imposter does the waltz. King Roland is like, ah, yes, good. White dance, our dance, royal dance, that dance, good dance, waltz wins. After all these years of being a king, he did not realize that different people have different cultures. Hey pal, you just blowing from stupid town? On top of that, the last test was both of them getting out of a maze. What does that prove? Season two, episode 28, we meet Carol of the Arrow and her merry band of do-gooders. They're a group that go around trying to help people in trouble and Sophia loves them. She starts to go up to Carol to ask for an autograph and overhears her saying that she's just doing the work that the royal family isn't doing. Carol was legitimately saying that the royal family doesn't do anything to help the villagers, which is the first time we've heard a morally good character speak out against the monarchy. Sure, the episode ends with all of them being chummy, but the seeds of doubt have been planted. The only saving grace is Sophia. Sophia keeps proving everyone wrong, but the royal family should still be questioned so that they can constantly do better. Carol even came through with anecdotal evidence. She talked about how her cousin Henry got stuck in a bog and the royal coach flew right overhead without even stopping. Did the royals apologize or even explain maybe they didn't see them? No, because Sophia makes all their mistakes better just by existing. In the episode Lord of the Ring, Hugo, a royal prep prince, who initially was really tough on Sophia for wanting to be in the flying derby because it's a boy's thing, now wants to do ice dancing, even though it's a girl thing. Love this character development. You go, Hugo. Crush gender norms. This episode also shows why he was initially a bullet. His dad is very traditional, anti-progressive, and wants his son to only do manly activities. In fact, the only reason Hugo's sex sexist homophobic dad comes around at the end is after he sees how good his son is. Very comforting to know that this king would verbally berate and abuse his son if he was anything short of exceptional whilst being a little fruity. Overthrow the monarchy. I saw this TikTok the other day of a UK flag being lowered while the pride flags were still up and this dude taking the video was like crying about it. That dude would be Hugo's dad. Can we pretend that airplanes night sky down, like shooting stars? The episode Pin the Blame on the Genie was very fascinating because it explores the social hierarchy of magical creatures. There was a whole court trial of a royal wizard accusing a genie of granting chaotic wishes that he actually didn't do. And plot twist, the royal wizard was also a genie the whole time and he was the one granting the chaotic wishes. What was the point of doing all that? The whole time he was trying to frame other genies to climb the social ladder, eliminate the chances of him getting caught in the lie, and direct quote about the disguise, the king would never take a genie seriously. There was only one way to get the job of my dreams, 
pretend not to be a genie. He's locked up in his lamp at the end, but can we address what he said? I don't think the king should view any type of magic over another. Season 4, episode 10, titled Princess Jade, we see Royal Prep and Dunwitty have a day where two students swap to see how the other half lives. Because in their words, royals and villagers make up a kingdom. If you don't think about this episode, it's kind of cute. But when you do think about this episode, what is the point of these Nepo babies showing off to the villagers? Like, what, what's the point? The storyline is, of course, Jade missing her quaint school. Because if the story went any other way, they'd have to make the fairy godmother spell out the fuck wucky part. Oh, you really enjoyed royal prep? Well, you can't actually go here because your, your parents aren't politicians. Only the children of politicians are allowed to know our silly little secrets. There are more examples of royalty being morally inept that I will mention while discussing the different formats of episodes. But first, my dead princess theory. What? It took 12 episodes since the movie pilot for another princess to be summoned. I almost thought they forgot they could do that. So Princess Jasmine appears and her advice is how to tame a wild carpet. In her words, you have to teach them how to listen to you and follow your orders. Oh dear God, I know that that's how domesticated animals work. Like if you get a dog, you need to teach the dog how not to bite. You wouldn't want your carpet biting back at you. Wait. That's not the issue. Oh, it's just another form of transportation livestock, like the Pegasi. Okay. Jasmine is a unique kind of princess because her story more so focuses on the upcoming prince, and she was born into royalty. She's been royal her whole life. So her advice of just giving orders is accurate, I guess. It's all she knows how to do. Then she disappears after she helps, just like Cinderella did. Jasmine's been dead for 50 years. Season 1, episode 17 is the first time we've seen the amulet curse Sophia because she was losing her way, bragging to her friends and being snobby. Belle was summoned to give her a lesson about giving a proper apology through actions instead of just words. In the episode Floating Palace, part 2, Sophia meets mermaids and even turns into one. So her amulet can do that too. And Princess Ariel appears as a mermaid. Made. Was this after the sequel? Was it after her kid? The timeline starts to get more confusing. Also, wait, Ariel's been dead for 50 years. The very next episode, season one, episode 24, Princess Aurora is summoned just to tell Sophia to ask her animal friends for advice. And that's all she does. That's it. Shortest, weakest cameo. She doesn't even sing. Go back to sleep, Sleeping Beauty. That eternal sleep. Because Sleeping Beauty's been dead. In season two, episode two, Snow White is summoned to help. And she appears in the mirror at the end of the episode, but not in real life. Uh? They're all fucking dead. Season two, episode 12, Mulan is the summoned princess. And fun fact, she's my favorite princess. And Leah Salonga came back to sing as Mulan, which was just magical. Now the two part special, The Curse of Princess Ivy, shows that sometimes the princesses that are summoned can be the curse. Cause not all of them are gonna give good advice. So it all starts with Sophia telling Amber about the amulet's power. And as a result, Amber literally steals it from Sophia. A Darman video title for this would be, Spoiled Princess Steals from her own sister and lives to regret it. So Princess Ivy is summoned from the amulet and she is a princess that was arrested for trying to overthrow her sister. Are we seeing some parallels? Also, this is how she reacts when the amulet teleports her. Where am I? What is this place? This is confirmation that princesses are taken from wherever they were. So in her case, the slammer. But I still think princesses can be summoned from the spirit realm. Especially because this princess was so freaked out when she appeared, which never happened with the other princesses. Princess Rapunzel was also summoned during this special. Moving on, season two, episode 20, Princess Tiana is summoned and even says, if what Mama Odie told me is true, then I'm here to help you. Season three, episode five, Merida is the princess that's summoned and she teaches Sophia how to be brave. Yep, yep, like, like her name. The last princess that was summoned was weirdly enough, Olaf. I guess they couldn't afford Idina Menzel or Kristen Bell, but they explained in the episode it was because crazy crystals were put on the amulet. So from season three onward, if the amulet isn't being used to summon princesses, what is it being used for? What isn't it being used for? Seasons one and two feel completely different than seasons three and four. The first two seasons feel like taking a casual stroll, very episodic and silly. They even made the bunny character do the Gangnam style dance and they thought I wouldn't notice. Nothing gets past me. But from season three on, it is a marathon, jumping from plot point to plot point and expanding the universe so much more, it feels like there should be a hundred more episodes. You'll see what I mean when we discuss the secret library, Elena of Avalor, Sophia's summonings, and the Mystic Isle. 
Girls. But for now, let's talk about how certain characters are just tossed aside. Ruby and Jade, Sophia's friends from the village, made constant appearances throughout the first two seasons. They kept Sophia grounded, reminded her of her roots, and even aided in Amber's growth when they befriended her. But we barely see them in seasons three and four, and it's very disappointing. Another character they were hyping up only for it to feel like they discarded is Bailiwick. Bailiwick is the castle steward. He is loyal and kind, and in the beginning they made it a point to talk about how you can always count on Bailiwick. They even had a whole song about it. You can always count on Bailiwick. But when season three and season four take on a more adventurous tone, he goes unseen. I think the second half of the series is very ambitious, but they didn't have enough time or episodes to show Sophia's everyday life. It makes it feel a bit more frantic, and especially as someone who binged it, it just seems kind of stressful. Isn't she 10? Can we just chill for a second? The answer is no. What? Season three, episode five is such a random episode to have a game changer like this. Not a premiere, not a finale, smack in the middle of the season. Sophia finds a new purpose. In the previous episode, Minding the Manor, Sophia's Aunt Tilly gives her a book of all of Enchantia's history. And she keeps saying, knowledge is the key. Very ominous. This episode opens with Sophia reading from that book, and then all of a sudden her book had a baby book. Kind of reminds me of Wizardology. Oh, look at that. I made a video on it. Maybe you should check that out after this. Anyway, this tiny book mentions a world in the castle walls. So she goes there with the help of her amulet, which apparently her Aunt Tilly also had. This in the walls tunnel and pathways has references to all the other Disney princesses movie because this is a Disney princess show and it will not let you forget it. Then the book acted as a key. I really don't know how I didn't see that coming. After that, she ends up here. And uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is Calling. They want their secret library treehouse where they're summoned to help people with that. So yes, Sophia's purpose is to help people have a happier ending to their story. Essentially doing what the royals should be doing. Sophia's first mission is to help her horse Minimus's brother escape from an evil king. A king who's still in power by the end of the episode, by the way. Yikes. Also, I'm in the show. Nice to meet you, Athena. I also think it's important to note that Disney Plus marks all of these secret library episodes like they're a mini series within the series. And I was pretty surprised to see how few episodes actually utilize the secret library. In total, there's only seven episodes where Sophia goes on these life-changing missions. The main reason for this is because two out of seven of those episodes resulted in Sophia going on even bigger missions, namely the Elena of Avalor special and the Mystic Isles episodes. That and also the amulet can summon Sophia now. The first time Sophia is summoned to help another princess is in the episode Beauty is the Beast. And we find out that this princess also had the amulet. Does this mean that every Disney princess we've seen has also owned this amulet? That would have to span over a long period of time. Something that's even confirmed by the fact that this amulet is an ancient Moruvian necklace. And the kingdom of Maru doesn't even exist anymore, giving even more validity to my dead princess's theory. I don't know why this is the hill I'm willing to die on, but if I had the amulet of Avalor, it would bring me back just to give you advice. And, and here it is. Here it is. Subscribe to my channel. Okay, bye. I also find it very amusing that there's a difference between finishing stories and guiding princesses. It is very similar, but somehow it's two separate helpful abilities. Don't know why royalty is prioritized with teleportation straight to them. She doesn't have to go on a whole journey like with the library people. The princesses can't wait, they're rich. The only time the library told the story of a princess Sophia had to help that they didn't immediately transport her to was for a very specific instance. An instance so iconic, it was the start of this show's spinoff series. <laughs> the Elena of Avalor special is a glorious backdoor pilot. A backdoor pilot is when an episode of an existing series acts as a way to pitch another. One hilarious example of this is the episode Crash Nebula from Fairly Odd Parents, which I remember watching as a kid and being very confused. The whole episode was Timmy Turner watching his favorite show. He didn't partake in the plot. It just started with him, and then these characters I don't give a shit about took up the entire episode. It was also unsuccessful, as this series was never created. So what did Elena of Avalor do differently that made it successful? Well, it grabbed the attention of the viewer, because this was a pivotal moment in the series. Sophia also took action in this episode. She wasn't just pushed aside for characters we've never met before, which in turn actually made us care about Elena more. Elena was just as compelling 
telling, even though she still shared the spotlight. Now, in this video, I will only be discussing Elena and the Secret of Avalor episode, because the whole series will need a lore video all on its own. I tend to do that with spinoffs, like I did with Planet Sheen. So the one thing that really confuses me is my sister told me that the beginning of this episode was different when she watched this, and Wikipedia confirms this. According to the wiki, it says that the episode starts in Avalor, when Elena takes Naomi up to a mountain to show her her favorite view of the kingdom. Elena laments to Naomi about how she was trapped in the amulet of Avalor for 41 years and then presents to her a broken wand. She tells her that it was Shariki's wand and how she would still be trapped in the amulet if it was not for the brave young princess Sophia. Elena then proceeds to tell Naomi the whole story, but that scene didn't exist when we watched it in Disney+. Plus. In fact, I never even saw Naomi. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this is. I don't know why they took the scene out, but in all honesty, I think I like it better without it because the reveal of Elena being stuck in the amulet hits a lot harder when it isn't spelled out right at the start. The way the episode started without that opening scene is Sophia had a vision from the amulet of Elena being chased after her parents were murdered. Intense, I know. Parents on Common Sense Media would have hated that. If my kid sees bad guy on TV, my kid will be bad in real life. Don't make my life as a parent harder where I have to explain to my kid that murder is wrong. So obviously Sophia is disturbed by this strange daydream. Why would she think such a thing? It's called intrusive thought, Sophia. No, actually the amulet leads her back to the secret library. Elena's book comes out and usually the book narrates itself here, but for whatever reason, with this one, a man pops out. He is the royal wizard of Avalor who turned himself into a book. You know what they say, you are what you eat. What are you talking about? What are you doing? This is when it was revealed to me that Elena was stuck in Sophia's amulet for 41 years. And all this time, Elena from inside the amulet was searching for someone to free her. The culture of Avalor was explored, as well as Elena's family, as well as how the evil dictator held power by outlawing magic, music, and joy. But these are all things I will explore for that lore, so stay tuned. But right now I wanna talk about how all of this pertains to Sophia. After Elena left the amulet, it changed from purple to pink but it still contains magic. The only thing that's different, which was revealed the episode after, is that now Elena is not the one giving her powers. Now, Sophia is in control. So up until now, all of these powers and curses were just Elena testing Sophia, which in retrospect, is wild. Elena, did you have to make Sophia croak like a frog because she was a little gloaty when she got the solo? Was that really necessary? It seems like overkill. Also, remember when crazy crystals were put on the amulet? Now I'm picturing Elena in there high as shit. I'm so fucking scared, man. 41 years is a long ass time. Before we discuss the Mystic Isles, because that can of worms was introduced way too late in the game, let's discuss Cedric and his little raven buddy, Wormwood. Because the way they approached his development was so fun to watch. Because for a very long time, Cedric's nefarious plans were unknown to anyone. Which is very funny because he's just in general shady. But the more time that passes and the more you see him bond with the family, you start to get tricked along with them. And even though we, the audience, know that he wants to take the throne and backstab the royal family, we also start to understand why. For example, in season one, episode four, we see how terrible King Roland is to him. Lamenting, can my royal sorcerer do anything right? And this is just because a king from another kingdom came up to Roland and like bragged about his own royal sorcerer. So he was just embarrassed that he couldn't show off. Like, you're a king. Get your priorities straight. In the two-part special, The Floating Palace, Cedric takes his scheme to a new level by turning into a botched Ursula Loch Ness monster. Disney taking inspiration from itself is quite the sight to behold. I have such mixed feelings on that aspect of the show because for the most part, it's fun and done well, but it feels like they're patting themselves on the back just a bit too hard. Anyway, we see in Mystic Meadows where all the old retired sorcerers go. We meet Cedric's mom and dad here and we see how his dad always belittles him and acts like he can't do anything right. So he shares King Roland's contempt for his own son. Something that was alluded to in the episode Cedric's Apprentice, but because we only saw his father talking to him through a portrait, I wasn't sure if this was literal or just a projection of his dad. But no, these are his actual feelings. And they are repeated over and over again. Something that stings even more once we realize that Cedric's dad was the last royal sorcerer to King Roland's dad. And people called him the best. 
He's living in his father's shadow, and no one ever extends him any respect or gratitude until Sophia. But Cedric keeps scheming and comes up with the big brain plan season 3 episode 2 by creating a fake amulet and swapping it with Sophia's. And holy shit it looks great, A++ crafting, bestie. Decoy survivor hidden immunity idol type shit. And the best part is Sophia still doesn't know it was him in case the plan falls through. And also because he really cares what Sophia thinks. The amulet, or rather Elena, cursed him for his thievery by giving him sticky fingers. Very on the nose. And in the end, Cedric had to give back the amulet because he realized it was the only way to get rid of the curse. And don't worry, he still did so in a way that Sophia wouldn't find out. And at that point, he should have realized that the amulet wouldn't help him take over the kingdom anyway. Also, many of the powers the amulet gave him seemed useless. Because for example, one good deed he did was give a child the ability to jump high so she could win this game. So the amulet rewards him by giving him the ability to jump high. Uh? Wait, couldn't he have just given himself that? He's a sorcerer and he's always complaining about how people don't see how powerful he is. But dare I say, I don't even think he knows how powerful he is. When Cedric grows a second brain cell, it's over for all you bitches. Once we meet his sister Cordelia, we see that she too verbally berates him and doesn't respect Cedric. But more on their backstory in a second, because it's time for the reveal. The premiere of season four, Day of the Sorcerers, is one of my favorite episodes, even though the animation gets really wonky at times. Why does Sophia have a second pair of eyes? Who knows? And it's funny to think about how this episode never would have happened if they just arrested the Hexley Hall Wizard School Principal, season three, episode 26, when it was revealed he was conspiring against the monarchies. How many monarchies? Who knows? Too many. Look at how many kids go to this school. Back to Day of the Sorcerers, in this episode, Mystic Isles is mentioned for the first time. We hear very passively that it's where all the magic comes from. And then we see a group of evil sorcerers banding together. It's made up of a bunch of villains we've seen throughout the series, and they're being led by Grim Tricks, the headmaster I said should have been arrested last season. They call themselves the Order of the Wand, and they share Cedric's sentiment that wizards are wiser than royals. And even though Cedric's back on his villainous bullshit, it's nice to see him included in something. Now here's where things get real. Everyone shut up. He has a truly badass musical number about his moral dilemma. Because he wants to take the throne, but he doesn't want to disappoint Sophia. God, it's so good. My evil dreams will come true, but I'm not sure I want them to. And he looks so hot during this number for some reason. I don't know why, okay? He then freezes all of the royals. But when Sophia barges in and stops him and is heartbroken at the betrayal, he can't bring himself to freeze her. I was yelling throughout this episode because, dude, I'd be shitting my pants if I was Cedric seeing the royal family get unfrozen. He even tried to run, but an athlete he is not. He should have been practicing a teleportation spell. And before he was thrown into the dungeon, he and the king exchanged some very harsh words. Some very well-written words, too. I never thought you'd be capable of something like this. You didn't think I was capable of anything. Holy shit, what is happening? So here's where things get a bit silly. Sophia tries to convince her family not to lock him up because he didn't zap her. Her. And it's like, girly, why would they forgive him? He did zap them, though. But sh 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 he didn't zap me. That's what's important. I'm the main character. Needless to say, the family was not convinced. But he did get a chance to prove himself once Grim Tricks got as far as he did. Cedric stopped him and unfroze the family. Saving the day wasn't all, though. He groveled, apologized, Sophia pleaded his case again, and he was reinstated. Thus, his villain arc came to an end. And giving credit where credit is due, the family was a lot nicer to him from here on out as well. Cedric still has some more moments as a good guy, but we'll get to that in the later section. Let's just say he can't catch a break. Fuck you, Wormwood! Ah! The Mystic Isles were introduced in the three-part special, The Mystic Isles. As briefly mentioned in the season four premiere, this is where all the magic comes from. All the magical creatures we've seen throughout the series come from the Mystic Isles or their parents or ancestors have. The Mystic Isles are made up of the Isle of the Dragons, Isle of Wishes, Isle of Centaurs, Isle of Unicorns, Isle of Crystals, Mermaid Isle, Isle of Memories, Flying Carpets Isle, the Isle of Beanstalks, Isle of Fairies, Isle of Pirates and Fairies, the Isle of Dancing Deserts, Isle of Rompkins, Isle of Miracles, Isle of Trolls, Isle of Witches, Isle of Magical Birds, the Isle of Forever Frost, Isle of Wee Sprites, and the Isle of Magic Music. And there's probably even more because we've seen so many magical creatures throughout the series. 
So in this special, we discover that there are crystal masters that grow magic crystals in the Isle of Crystals. These crystals are for wizards to use in their scepters, wands, and amulets. But if you grow these crystals anywhere else, it'll take the magic from all who live there. Very similar to the Princess Ivy special, the villain in this special is also a jealous sister. Prisma wants to take all of the magic to finally be better than her sister, Azurine. This is once again a direct parallel to Amber, who is once again very jealous of Sophia's magical abilities. In her defense, Sense, who wouldn't be? And I didn't mention at the end of the Princess Ivy special, Amber's memories of that day were erased. And I guess so was all of her development from that experience. However, the revelation that Amber had with the song, That's Not Who I Am, was amazing. Essentially, she was like, oh, you use your powers to help people and you're always putting others above yourself. That's why you have them. You're worthy. I'm not. I'm not like that. That's not who I am, though it makes my heart break. Fuck it up. Fuck it up. I wish I could play an actual clip of the voice actor singing that because it's so good. This was the moment Amber truly changed and I'm glad it took so long because she had a long way to go. Here in the Mystic Isles, we also meet the Windwalkers, which are just hot angels, I guess. And Orion, one of the Windwalkers we meet, gives us valuable information. Where Sophia and Amber live is called the Ever Realm. I'm not sure if this is a happily ever after pun, but once Sophia defeats Prisma, she is offered to be protector of the Ever Realm. Now you can see what I mean when I said the series went zero to 100. Sophia keeps getting these jobs, which in all honesty are essentially the same thing. This just replaced Secret Library because a fun new world is involved and just like with Secret Library, Disney Plus labeled all the Mystic Isles episodes. Season 4, Episode 6, The Mystic Isles, The Princess and the Protector, Krista begins training Sophia on how to be a protector. And even though they got off to a rocky start, Sophia gains her enchantment by the end of the episode. An enchantment is a multi-purpose bracelet. Like her amulet, but less cool. Okay, honestly, there are uses to the enchantment that the amulet can't do. The enchantment has a magic rope and a witch way buff. The magic rope is self-explanatory. I almost forgot, you can also FaceTime with it. But how do you use a which way bow? You ask the bow where anything is and you shoot it into the sky and it makes an arrow pointing in the direction of what you're looking for. Another protector item that we're introduced to later is the necessity, which can create a door through anything. Sophia is officially OPP. An overpowered princess. At the end of the first training episode, Krista even exclaims, you're the first non-magical protector. We should call you Sophia the First. Ooh, they already made that joke in the pilot. Why do they call you Roland the Second? Because my father, the former king, was also named Rowan. Hmm, so I guess that makes me Sophia the First. <laughs> Just keep dancing, bitch. The rest of the Mystic Isles episodes have an overarching story, which started Season 4, Episode 14, The Falcon's Eye, where we learn about the Wicked Nine, which are magical items belonging to different famous villains, Jafar's staff, Ursula's necklace, etc. From this point on, Prisma, with the help of a shapeshifter named Twitch, and the Locket of Vor, Talk about having an unfortunate name. <laughs> are on a quest to collect all Wicked Nine items and be the most powerful villain. Another villain also joins their quests, which leads me to Cedric's Ark Part 2. Oh. The betrayal of Wormwood kills me. Because now that Cedric is finally gaining respect from everyone else, his sidekick from the start wants nothing to do with him. During the episode in Cedric We Trust, when Wormwood steals Grimaldo's crown, he made Cedric look suspicious again despite him having nothing to do with it. Wormwood abandoned Cedric without a second thought and joins Prisma to try and retrieve the Wicked Nine. This also makes Wormwood the only character we've known from the very beginning to not get redeemed. And when you see the plant he was named after, the foreshadowing was staring us in the face this whole time. Next, we have Cedric's petty backstory with his sister, as seen in the episode Through the Looking Back Glass. The Looking Back Glass is a mirror that's actually a flashback machine. You step through it and are put in a memory. You just can't interact with it. But you can watch it back, focusing on different details every time. Now, first of all, this magic has to be from the Isle of Memories. And I'm so glad we have this episode because this is the only time memory magic is used. All these years, his sister Cordelia the Conjurer blamed Cedric for her 
hair. She looks like one of those ads for those makeup mobile games that are really gross. Anyway, Cedric was actually not responsible because she bumped into the table accidentally mixing some of the potions. But honestly, even if he was fully responsible and he made that mistake and fucked up your hair, get over it! You are both children. How are you going to hold on to a mistake that was an accident, that he apologized for, that you actually caused for so many years? It would be different if she was just giving him the cold shoulder, but no. She and Roland and their parents berated this man for so long. It was kind for Roland to forgive Cedric after the betrayal, but it was arguably even kinder for Cedric to forgive him after all these years. I want to see Cedric's storyline in an Am I the Asshole style Reddit post because I want to know what Reddit would say. Would they say everyone sucks here? Would they say not the asshole? What would they say? <laughs> Now we have to acknowledge the sheer amount of villains and antagonists because I honestly think there might be just as many as Word Girl. Other than Cedric and Wormwood, we have Princess Ivy and Prisma, as I mentioned, but we also have Miss Nettle, the fairy apprentice of Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. She is so iconic. I hate that I haven't mentioned her till now. Her song, Are You Kidding Me? It was such a whopping fairy number four. I will say it's really random that in one Miss Nettle appearance, she had a sidekick named Rosie but we never saw her again. It's like they were trying to convince us she was there the whole time and then just gave up halfway through. Oh, you know, Rosie. Yeah, Miss Nettle's Rosie. Forget about Rosie, she fucking sucks. Other villains include Mama New Slickwell, Sir Oliver, who tried to make dragons look like the bad guy for no reason, Morgana, enemy of Merlin, Sophia the Worst, an evil magic clone of Sophia, Grim Tricks, Wendell the Wizard, Crispy, Greylock the Grand, Omar, who wanted to make genies look bad for no reason despite being one himself, Baron Von Roca, a magical musician that takes other people's talents to make himself grow stronger, Shariki, who's the villain of Elena of Avalor, the shapeshifter Twitch, and the finale's villain, Vor. Now before the series finale, the future of each kid is talked about. In the episode A Royal Wedding, it is revealed that Amber is the next Queen of Enchantia because she is seven minutes older than James. For whatever reason, and King Roland just assumed it was the firstborn boy, but that's not the case. His older sister Tilly just didn't want to be queen. But Amber, unlike Tilly, does. And James is pissed. The thing is though, if this was the first, second, or even third season, James's fear of her being a selfish leader would be completely vindicated. However, throughout this episode, it is very clear that Amber has done a lot of research into the customs of different creatures to ensure that she respects them and greets them appropriately. She genuinely wants to do her best and be a good leader. By the end of the episode, once James stops his sabotaging shenanigans and apologizes, he realized Wait a second, I found most of that king shit boring. I actually want to be a knight. A good revelation to have considering the next episode is the Royal School Fair. The kids are graduating Royal Prep and have to decide where they're going next. There are academies for alchemy, knights, leaders, music, adventurers, fashion, and more. They also have to make this decision in a day, which really freaks out Sophia. But here's something I can't ignore. Sophia is more secure in her career as a protector than any of these other kids are with their future careers. Sophia is is already training to be a protector, which seems like a full-time job. And the training is rigorous. What is she going to learn at any of these academies that's worth spending that much time on? Guess we'll never figure out because the season's pretty much over. Also, sorry, I'm bringing back the wage gap for a second. What choices do the Dunwitty school children have? Do they have the same options for careers, but the schools are just less luxurious? Or are these careers not even a possibility for them? We don't have time to unpack all of that. Who? let's unpack this finale and then we'll discuss if Sophia truly is a Mary Sue. So Forever Royal is the three-part conclusion. It starts with Royal Prep's graduation, but poor powerful Sophia keeps getting called to the Mystic Isles for some sort of protector initiation or something. Meanwhile, this 10-year-old that's somehow the only person with sense is like, wait, if all the protectors are meeting up here, who's watching the cash register? Don't you think Prisma's gonna take advantage of this opportunity? And that's exactly what happened. She tries to steal the Wicked Nine. How did none of the other protectors think of that? Luckily, they get to Prisma on time. Or do they? They don't, because Vor, inside the locket, was orchestrating this whole operation and was taking advantage of Prisma. Vor, using the power of the Wicked Nine, is now freed from the locket. And the first thing she does is start attacking everything Sophia loves. Sophia is exhausted. Sophia just wanted to graduate. But then she's called to the secret library, which we're finally seeing again. She is presented with a story. There was a young girl named Sophia. It's about 
me. Wait, is this fucking play about us? And from Sophia's story, we see so much needed backstory. We learn that Sophia's biological father is a sailor who was lost at sea. Don't mention any current events. And we learn that King Roland wanted kids so badly, he made a wish on a wishing well. And even though he got what he wanted, and as a result, James and Amber were born, the queen, his wife, died in the process. Also, sorry, that wishing well is super evil. Because we actually saw it back in season two, episode eight. And in that episode, the wishing well was like, Mwahaha, be careful what you wished for. Which at the time just seemed cliche. Until you realize that he literally killed the king's wife. What a jerk! There is no queen of Enchantia. So once the story ends where we're at now, Sophia's like, I don't think I can do this. I tried everything I could. But then the narrator of the story reveals himself. The first story keeper! Which would have hit harder if Elena of Avalor didn't already do that. Ratio. You fell off, first story keeper. But for whatever reason, this gives Sophia new life. And there's the sequence of her using her powers back to back to back. <laughs> And quite frankly, Sophia deniers are in denial. This kid could have taken down Thanos, easily. So she frees her family, and her parents are in awe because they didn't know she was doing all this shit. They did not know how much world saving she was up to. But for whatever reason, Roland still thinks he's in charge. And he's like, I'll save my family and then the kingdom. And Sophia says, and I quote, I think the fuck not. I'm sorry, I'm sorry but I have, have to do this. this. I, I wish, wish I was a flying horse. horse. Wait! <laughs> So good. If there's one thing the king did right, it was decide to have kids and marry Miranda. Sorry the OG queen fell. Aww. Rip. Never forget, even though you were never mentioned until now. But Sophia is like, you can't prioritize just your family because the entire kingdom is your family when you're the king, dude. Guys, I'm not even joking. The song One and All almost made me cry. When you're a ruler, your family is everyone and you need to protect everyone. And listen up, Amber, no hesitation, is like, I'm going with Sophia. So quite frankly, those common sense reviewers from the beginning of this video can kiss my ass. Amber's character development was amazing. You just had to be there. So Amber goes off with Sophia and James is like, I'm going to be a knight. I agree with them. Turn this ship around. And who backs him up? Aunt Tilly, but most importantly, Cedric. Let's go. The final boss battle happens inside the amulet, and Vor almost backed Sophia into a corner. But in an Avengers Endgame type moment, all of the princesses of the past remind Sophia what she's learned. It was very brief, but I'm still glad they had this full circle moment because the princesses haven't appeared in forever. Also, I don't even have to say it, this gives more validity to the dead princesses theory. They are spirits, dude. Now this ending confuses me. I think Sophia fully killed Vor. It's completely skimmed over, but like, I think she's dead. Then finally, all of Sophia's friends and family conjured Sophia out of the amulet with the power of love, which is kind of fucked up because Sophia did in at most an hour what took Elena 41 years to do. And she keeps the amulet at the end? Uh? What the hell? A Mary Sue is defined as a female character who is unrealistically depicted as having no flaws or weaknesses. Now I can make a case for Sophia from seasons one to three. Let's talk about every time Sophia has done something morally questionable. And then let's talk about how season four kind of dropped the ball a bit. Season one, episode two, she literally called her lifelong friends embarrassing just because her new rich friends didn't approve of them. Sure, she made up for it almost immediately, but her new lifestyle did begin to corrupt her as seen again in season one, episode 17, when she was rubbing her success in their faces. Also, this can't go ignored. For the entirety of season one, she was pronouncing Cedric's name wrong. She just kept saying it, Cedric. He kept correcting her and she kept doing it. This ongoing joke thankfully dropped by season two, but how are you gonna call a character perfect if she can pronounce Bailiwick but refuses to say Cedric correctly? I think it's on purpose. I'll just say it. I think she was fucking with him. But throughout the entire series, the only time Sophia pissed me off was in season three, episode three. Amber was being so rude to the new girl Zoe. Sophia sees this, but still tried to pressure Zoe to include Amber in the club she just started. When Zoe refuses, because again, Amber was really mean to her, Sophia sides with Amber, who by the way, just started her own club to try and one-up Zoe. Just because they're sisters, Sophia took Amber's side. Amber didn't apologize at this point, by the way. This episode didn't even frame Sophia being the one in the wrong. She thought, she really thought Zoe and Amber were equally wrong. Amber, for 
for provoking and being mean to Zoe, and Zoe for, let me see if I'm getting this right, not forgiving Amber immediately. So just, so just take that in. Season 3, episode 6, Sophia is committing a federal crime by opening somebody else's mail. You can say this is ignorance all you want, but her parents literally told don't open other people's mail. Now all of that being said, she still is a Mary Sue in season 4. Not only for her being perfect, but also because of the endless opportunities she's given. You know the saying, one door closes, another door opens? That doesn't happen with Sophia. All the doors are open. No other character comes close. And I get it, she's the main character. But the inclusion of the secret library, her being summoned, and being the protector of back to back to back was a lot. Now for my final thoughts, theories, and how I would change the ending. So there are a lot of huge things here that went unaddressed. When Vor thought she won towards the end of the series finale, we got to hear the next part of her plan. She explained she wanted to take over another world. She even elaborates, above the Isle of Pirates and Fairies, beyond the second star to the right, is a portal to another world. Let's think about this in the context of the Disney multiverse. Is she talking about Neverland? This is actually wild. What's even more wild is I genuinely thought I was the first person to notice it. It's on the wiki, girly poop. Everyone knows this, apparently. Also, we see a lot of bizarre politics throughout this entire series. In the season four episode, The Elf Situation, tensions are high between forest elves and river elves. And throughout this season, they were playing off the elf situation as kind of a joke. So it's very surprising that they addressed it in a full episode. They even added dialogue as to why Roland was so concerned about this feud. As long as they keep squabbling, they'll never get that road built. Anyway, have fun today. This shows that the Kingdom of Enchantia is very hands-off with other kingdoms and creatures' problems until it affects them. Meanwhile, all Sophia ever does is solve everyone's problems, which may be Mary Sue-ish, but keep in mind, this is a kid's show. It's nice to have a role model that kids can strive for, so let's all just chill a bit. Okay, now for how I'd change the ending. I don't think Sophia should have kept the amulet. I think that should have been sacrificed in some way during the battle or to get her out of it. And it can also serve as a lesson to Sophia that she doesn't need it. I also think Wormwood should have had a larger ending. Like he is just a follower through and through, but when Cedric captured him, I wish there was more time dedicated to that. Like, yes, you two grew apart, but there's still some history there. And that was Sophia the first. And we didn't even mention the Celians, the Flegel, which somehow aren't fairies, the half pelican, half elephants, and the sweet smelling lavender skunks. Dear God, this world was so elaborate and fun and the songs were killer. I really hope you enjoyed because I sure did. The only thing is, and I'm warning you about this in advance, Elena of Avalor lore is coming in August. I can't jump straight into that story right now because I need a sillier buffer. Doodlebop's lore is coming out in July. I know that's gonna be so chaotic. And the full July schedule will be up in the community tab very soon, so keep your eye out for that. I hope you have a great day, butt lovers. See you in the next one. Bye!